Welcome everyone to this demonstration of ArchivesSpace, an overview of ArchivesSpace member benefits. I'm Jessica Crouch, the Community Engagement Lead for ArchivesSpace. I've been with the ArchivesSpace program for almost five years, working with archivists and community members to develop educational opportunities and resources for archi archivists using the application. Before this, I worked as an archivist in a large academic setting, and a lot of my references and examples are informed by that. So if I say something that doesn't match your process exactly, feel free to ask for clarity. We all know there are many different processes and ways to do things in archives, and the same is true for archive space. This session is intended for people considering using archive space. If you're already an archive space user or hopefully member, this presentation will probably not offer any new information, but you're more than welcome to attend. I'll begin by giving a brief overview of the archive space program before moving to a light demonstration of the application itself. After, I'll provide information about archive space membership and member benefits. We are using the latest version of Archive Space for this demo, which is version 3.4.1. If you're using an earlier version of Archive Space, keep in mind some of the features you see today may not be available to you. We also won't be able to troubleshoot issues with your own implementations of Archive Space at your organization, and we'll be focusing this demonstration on using the Archive Space staff user interface and public user interface. If you have a question or issue with your own implementation, please email us at archivespacehome at lyricist.org, and I'll include that email address at the end of this session. The session is being recorded, and all presentation slides and links will be made available with this recording. So, after all of that, what is ArchivesSpace? ArchivesSpace is an open source content management system used by archivists in a variety of settings to manage and describe their collections and to optionally make those collections publicly available through our public user interface. ArchivesSpace supports a range of functions performed in archives and special collections, including accessioning, arrangement, description, preservation, and access, and allows archivists to describe a variety of materials, including both physical items and digital objects. Archive Space is the successor to two widely used open source applications, Archivist Toolkit and Archon. We know many archives continue to use these two systems, and we do have migration tools available on our website for those users looking to migrate to Archive Space from these legacy systems. In short, Archive Space is developed by archivists, supported by diverse archival repositories, and fills a common need for archives around the world. While the ArchivesSpace application is free to download and use, ArchivesSpace has a membership model to support the development of the application and user community. Only organizations that are members of ArchivesSpace directly contribute to the sustainability of the application, and because of that, and because of that support, members of ArchivesSpace are entitled to certain tangible benefits, and I'm going to get into those after the demo. In addition to these benefits, members also serve on the various governance groups within ArchivesSpace, including our User Advisory Council, Technical Advisory Council, and Board. Members are also asked to participate in community discussions and polls about the future development of the application. In this way, ArchivesSpace members work together to create and improve an archives management application reflecting our shared values as archivists. That means Archive Space is standards driven, flexible and extensible, customizable and localizable, and integrates with other applications people use to do their work, and it promotes efficiency overall. And Archive Space is and provides an opportunity for archivists to manage and make available as much archival material as possible, no matter their institutional setting. We have archive space members working in large government archives and major academic institutions, as well as community archives and loan arrangers working in very small organizations. Archive space promotes adoption of standards and develops shared best practices across all of these organizations and brings people from different sizes and types of institutions together to solve common problems we all share. Archive Space also provides the opportunity to take all of this work, all of this archival description, and make it available to users via a public user interface, which we will see a little later. And with that, I'm going to move over to the Archive Space application and the demonstration portion of the session. Okay. All right, so at this point, uh, you should be seeing Archive Space. You should be seeing um, the 
the just the main page that you see when you log into Archive Space. Uh, in this demonstration, I'm going to spend most of our time exploring the Archive Space staff user interface, which is what this is. This is where archivists and those working to describe material will be spending most of their time, so it makes sense that we will be spending most of our time here. After, I'll move to the Archive Space public user interface very briefly to show what that would look like for researchers or, or patrons. Before I dive into the demo, I want to mention that all of the examples we are using today are real collections held by Archive Space member organizations. These organizations made their metadata available to the program for the purposes of education and training and in the interest of creating a more diverse set of example data for users. We're very grateful to these organizations for their willingness to share their data. So. Uh, this staff user interface that you see, it's a very simple screen. Uh, it doesn't look like there's a lot going on here, but actually this is where you can really invoke basically all of the functions you're going to want to use in the staff user interface. This staff user interface is divided into four command areas or zones. I'll just call them zones throughout this session. Um, the first is, is up here, if you can see my mouse. Uh, this is where you really can do repository and application management. Um, this is if you're at a larger organization where you have multiple repositories within Archive Space. So maybe you have multiple libraries at your organization and you all want to share one Archive Space instance because you do want to make all of your collections discoverable in one single location, but you want to manage them yourselves within your individual libraries. You can uh, have multiple repositories within archive space. And if you have the, the permissions that allow you to move be between repositories, you can change the repository you're in here. Um, keep in mind, you would need to have the permissions to be able to go into those different repositories. Uh, and I know that there are also times where maybe you have a student worker or an intern where you don't want them moving around in different repositories. You just want them to be working in the one area they're supposed to be working. Um, and in that case, they wouldn't be able to move between repositories. And of course, many organizations have one single repository. They don't have a need for multiple repositories. So when you log in, you're automatically in the repository you want to be in. Uh, this is also where you can take care of many um, system-wide uh, functions. So you can manage your controlled value list and container profiles, location profiles. We're not going to have time to get into that here today, but those are the sort of things that you would do uh, that would impact the entire system. Those controlled values lists would be for everyone. Um, and this is also where you can manage your repositories. So if you need to make changes to your repositories, uh, maybe it moves and you need to change the address or something like that, you can do that. Um, you can also manage your users, manage your OAI PMH settings, and you can also view the system information. Um, this all, like I said before, is completely dependent on your permission level. So if you are uh, an employee or you have a staff member that does not have the permissions that allow them to make these sort of system-wide changes, they would not see any of this as an option. Uh, the only option that they would see would be the ability to click the Archive Space Help Center, which would take them out to the Archive Space Help Center, which contains our user manual, user tutorial videos, uh, and recordings of trainings. And again, you'd need to be an Archive Space member to access that, but that would be the only thing that a person without any other level of permissions would be able to see. Uh, this is also where you, if can change your preference management. And again, you can see this is dependent on your permission level. If you're an administrator or have that level of permission, you can change the preferences at a global level, which means it would impact everyone across all repositories at your institution. Uh, the, or you could have the permission to just change preferences with, across your single repository if you have that. Or if you are an individual who wants to change your preferences just for your own single view of archive space, you can always do that. Um, you can also manage user accounts. And if you're an administrator, you have the option to become a user. This is really handy if maybe you have a user saying, I'm not able to do this or I'm not seeing this the way that you're saying that I should be seeing this. You can log in as them and, and maybe troubleshoot what that issue is. The next section uh, right below, uh, this is really where you can take care of some um, user permissions and preference management sort of stuff. This, again, dependent on your permissions. I'm going to say that a lot. Uh, this is where you can manage those permission groups. We're not going to have time to get into user access and permissions, but know that you can get really granular with the, the permission groups that you have within Archive Space, people that maybe you only want them to have view only access or only be able to edit records but not delete. You can really um, 
determine what those permission groups are and you can manage that individual user access. Uh, you also can manage things like assessment attributes. Archivespace has an assessment module. So if you want to make assessments of collections, you can manage those assessment attributes here. We're not gonna have time to get into that. Just know that you can um, make assessments of material in archive space. It's also where you can do some bulk actions on your top containers. Um, and that means like the physical containers for your material. So your boxes and things like that. Uh, if you need to maybe uh, update some barcodes and, and things like that, you can do that here. Uh, you also can do some big things like transfer one repository into another. Um, I will say that's probably something that you will do rarely or never, but it is possible. Uh, and it, this is also one place where you can uh, invoke different background jobs. There's another place as well, and I'll show that in just a minute. But background jobs are things like maybe you want to export a PDF or you'd like to import data into archive space. Um, speaking of importing data into archive space, this is also where you can pull up and download bulk import templates. So if you're looking to import uh, specific record types into archive space, there are templates that help you do that. Of course, you can create different record types directly in archive space or use something like the API, which we're not going to have time to get into today. But these bulk import templates are another way to help you just get information into archive space uh, in bulk and a little bit quicker. Uh, this is also one place where you can run reports or invoke reports in ArchivesSpace. ArchivesSpace has canned reports as well as uh, the ability to create custom report templates, and you can do both of those things here. Um, and then finally, if you have any plugins, you can invoke the plugins here as well. ArchivesSpace comes with one plugin out of the box, the Li Library of Congress Name Authority File plugin, which allows you to import um, names and subject headings from the Library of Congress. So that that's always there when you download archive space, but if you have any other plugins, you can um, find those there as well. Then moving over to the left side of your screen, uh, this is really the, the kind of probably the important part, the reason that you're here. This is where you can go to create records in archive space. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about this drop-down menu and these different record types that you now see. So when you hit create, you're given a variety of options for the types of records that you might want to create. Um, if you look at the way this drop-down works, there's like this little line here. Um, the three record types above that line, your accession records, your resource records, and your digital object records are known collectively as material description records. Um, these are really the, the relevant records for your collections. Um, these are the records that you're going to be creating uh, to describe your materials. And then the records that you see below that line are meant to amplify those records. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But uh, your accession resource and digital object records are the record types I'm going to take some time discussing in this demo before we move over to the public user interface. Uh, both resource and digital object records allow for multi-level description, uh, and you can see that through component records. And again, I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. But these other records, your subject records, your agent records, which are your people, family, corporate bodies, and software, um, as well as things like um, locations and events, as assessments, like I mentioned, classifications. These are for amplifying the material description record. So they indicate where the material is, like a location record, or they indicate who the creator of the material is, or who the donor of the material is, or, who the rel or what the relevant subjects for the material are. Um, a neat thing about archive space is when it comes to things like creating your um, thesaurus or maybe creating locations, you, you can create them independently of an accession resource or digital object record. So you could um, build out a library of subject headings or you could create your locations in bulk and then they already exist in the system waiting for you whenever it's time to link them to a relevant record. So that is an option. You do not have to create them um, they're not dependent on the accession or resource or digital object record already existing for them to be created. Uh, and then finally, this is another place where you can run those background jobs. So you see um, that there are many different background jobs you can run, um, but uh, and you can also create reports from here, but you can create container labels, again, generate a PDF, which it, uh, many people do, um, import data and a few other options. 
Um, and then in addition to create, you also have the ability to browse. This just allows you to browse records that have already been created. So you're going to see the browse screens for a session resource and digital object in just a second, but just know that you can browse records that are, have already been created. And of course, the, the final section I want to highlight is the ability to search. Um, so you can do a basic keyword search in archive space, and you also have the option to do um, advanced searches and you uh, can have an advanced search just by clicking that arrow. Um, both options permit searching every record type of archive space in the application, but only within your current repository. So if you're in the staff user interface, which we are, and you are searching across record types, you're only going to get results for the repository in which you are actively working, the repository you have selected. Um, that is not true for the public user interface. You would get results across all repositories. We'll talk about that in just a second. But if you're searching within the, the staff user interface, you're only going to be getting records from the specific repository you're working in. Um, with advanced search, you can uh, link multiple search types uh, together. Um, they must be connected with Boolean operators. The You must use and, or, or not. Those are what are available. And and is the default option for searching. I'm going to close this. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and move into discussing uh, a session records, resource records, and digital object records. I'm just going to show them very briefly. I'm not going to build any records in this demonstration. I'm really just going to show you what a, a blank uh, a session record looks like, resource record, and digital object record look like. And then I'm going to show you what a completed record looks like. Um, but of course, if you have questions during the Q&A and there's time, we can always move back into other things. So what I'm going to first do is I'm going to show you, um, this is an accession record. This is a, a blank accession record template. Um, there are many options in archive space that allow you to maybe um, complete things a little bit qu more quickly. And I'm going to talk about that in just a second. But this is, if you just go to create a session, this is the record that you get. Um, a few things uh, before we, we move on. Um, I just want to highlight all throughout the application, if you've probably noticed, and the more you use the application, the more you will notice, there are these little question marks all over. Uh, these are content sensitive help links. Any place that you see a question mark, that means that there is a relevant page in our user manual uh, that can help you. So if you're creating an accession record for the first time and you're, you're saying, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do about this, you can click the, um, the relevant content sensitive help link and be taken to our user manual and get help on a session records. It can get pretty granular. So um, some of these links will take you to sub pages within the manual. So it's very, very handy. And again, you would need to be um, an archive space member to access the user manual and you would need to be logged in. So if you are a member and you are clicking one of these and you're getting a, a warning that you're in a restricted space, you probably just either haven't created your Help Center account yet, or if you have, you just need to log back in. But if you're having issues, you can always um, email us. Another really handy thing to keep in mind as you're creating records in archive space uh, and maybe are trying to figure out what fields to use and what fields not to use, uh, there are rollover tooltips throughout the application. So these rollover texts are associated with almost all of the labels within archive space. If you can see, I just <laughs> rolled over title and it gave me one. Uh, so these texts... Um, all you have to do is hover your mouse over a particular heading or label and they'll pop up, it just did. Uh, typically the rollover is gonna consist of the definition of the element to help you decide if you want to use that field or not. Um, if there are relevant or appropriate rules in DAX or um, to an export, uh, export data format like MARC or EAD, it's gonna give you that, it's gonna reference that. And then frequently it will include some examples of best practice. Um, these are the tooltips as they look out of the box, but they are completely modifiable, so you can change them within your individual application, so that way you can integrate your own processes and procedures. Uh, maybe you want to have a tooltip say, never ever use this field, you could do that, um, or you can reference a different standard like I said, G. So this is uh, an accession record template. As you can see, it's very... Um, there's, there are a lot of options. You can scroll through the whole thing. There are many different sub records um, and you can click on one of these to add a note. So you could hit add, ang add 
language and then suddenly a language note pops up. Um, something to keep in mind is anywhere you see a red asterisk that indicates a required field. That means that you can't save the record until you put something there. Uh, whenever you are creating a new record uh, within archive space, anything that needs to be required, that field will already be open for you. But you noticed just now when I selected to add a language before there was no red asterisk for language, but now that I have opened up a language field, there is a red asterisk there. That means that you must put something there now in order to save it. Or if you've changed your mind and you don't want to record that, you just hit X and confirm removal and that red asterisk is gone and you'll be able to save it. Um, accession records, um, I'm sure many of you already know, uh, store information about the receipt of materials, which are typically unprocessed. An accession record can be for a single item or it can be for an aggregation of materials. So it can represent the acquisition of a new collection or an accrual of an existing collection. Um, to save an accession record with an archive space, all you must record is an identifier and a date for the accession. Of course, you're gonna to wanna to include much more information than that. So let's go over to the accession browse screen and let's um, view an accession record that already exists. And I'll talk a little bit more about browse screens when we move over to accession records or to resource records, I'm sorry. Uh, but this is a completed uh, accession record. So you can see the required information is included, but there's also some other things uh, that are relevant to the collection um, and uh, a significant amount, of, significant amount of information. Some dates have been included, which does open up additional required fields. Um, and this is probably what you're going to want to do. You may want to include inventories or box lists, uh, condition descriptions, uh, content descriptions and in your accession record. But you can notice here that you don't have to fill out every single field. And I wouldn't recommend filling out every single field just because the field exists doesn't mean you need to put something there. Uh, you can then link your accession records to other types of records in archive space, uh, like existing resource records, digital object records. Um, you could link relevant subjects, relevant um, people, so donors, that sort of thing. You can link collection management and you can even link it to other, uh, other accession records. Um, and finally, uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about accession records, but one really neat functionality within archive space for accession records is the ability to spawn a new either accession record resource record or an archival object record, which I'm not gonna have time to get into. Those are the component records within a resource record from an accession record. I know I'm speaking very quickly and I'm talking about a lot of different record types that are unfamiliar, but just know if you created an accession record in archive space, um, instead of having to duplicate a lot of that work and a lot of that description, you can spawn your resource record, your collection record, um, that finding aid or get a start essentially of that finding aid uh, by hitting spawn. So whenever you are finished with your accession record, if you would like to start uh, building out that finding aid, you just need to spawn a new resource record. And when you select spawn, it will uh, auto populate some fields for you uh, that you then will need to clean up, clarify, and then save. It does not automatically save a new resource record for you, but it does give you that jump start on description so that you're not having to duplicate all of the work uh, of, of creating that record. Um, but that does not mean that you have to use accession records. They are completely optional. You do not have to have an accession record within archive space to then create a resource record. You can create resource records completely independently of accession records. So let's move over to resource records now. Uh, again, so I just, what I, I'm just moving through tabs, but if you want to create a resource record, all you have to do is go to create resource record and you get uh, an empty template like this. This is a resource record. So, um, for most people here, if you're not familiar with archive space terminology, a resource record is your finding aid. It's your catalog record. This is really the place where you put are going to put most of your description. Um, you could create either a single um, collection level record for you, this material, or you could create that hierarchical uh, description that we are very familiar with as archivists when we are creating those finding aids, uh, you would be doing that here in what we call resource records. So within the context of archive space, resources can be defined as materials that are in the custody of an archival repository and are being controlled according to archival principles. It can be a whole collection or it could be a single item. 
um, and it's defined by an identifier or a title. Um, like I said, this is where you're going to place the bulk of information about the intellectual and physical characteristics of materials. And within a given resource record, you can add a range of descriptive elements, as well as notes, write statements, and uh, various linked repository records. The description of the archival resource can be supplemented with certain context, and you can link it with those things, like I said, relevant um, individuals or uh, relevant name authority files or subject records, um, and you can link those relevant collections together that way. Essentially, as I said, it's where you build your finding aid, and it's also where you can export out that finding aid into a variety of formats, including EAD, Mark XML, and PDF. So um, this is a blank resource record. Um, You'll see there are now many more red asterisks, so there is more required, obviously, to create a valid resource record uh, to be in compliance with standards. So you would need to complete all of this information. If you're spawning from an accession record, some of this will already be auto-populated for you, but if you're creating a fresh resource record, you would need to complete all of this information uh, before you could save the record. So let's browse the current resource records within this instance. So uh, this is the browse screen for resource records. As I said before, when you are searching or browsing on the staff side, you're only seeing collections that are in the uh, repository you're in. So you're only getting results for the repository you're in, uh, but you are seeing all of the created resource records here. Um, this is really great because if you're looking for a specific resource record and you know that record exists, you just can't find it, you can filter by text uh, and find it that way, or you can look at the various linked records like subjects. Um, you can also uh, search by different things like the language of material and if a record is published or not. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about publishing when we get into the public user interface, but just know that ArchivesSpace does not automatically publish anything. It is entirely up to the user and dependent on the user to select whether or not material gets published to the public user interface. Um, but this is how you can browse those resource records. So very quickly, I'm just going to show two different um, examples of resource records, and then I'm going to move on. Um, the first, this is taking a second to load, but this is the, a resource record that is a is single level in nature. This diary is described at the collection level um, and it's described pretty in depth. You can see there's 12 notes here. And so we can just drop down and, and load these notes and see this is a very complete finding aid. Um, condition governing use and access, scope and contents note, um, physical description, everything that you would anticipate seeing in a collection. And it is single level in nature. And that is perfectly fine. Um, I'm going to slowly scroll back up. But this is what a completed, saved, single level resource record looks like in archive space. Um, and you have the ability, once it's saved, to do a lot of different things to this record. Um, load via spreadsheet indicates those um, import templates that we talked about. The ability to do different things like uh, build out the hierarchy if you'd like, use some rapid data entry tools. These all become available to you once the record is saved. Also becoming available to you are all of these top level abilities like to publish the record or unpublish the record. Um, if you need to export out those formats that we talked about, you want to export out a PDF or your EAD, you would do that here. Um, and then you can do some other things that you probably would do less often like transfer and merge this record, but this is a single level record. Um, I'm going to go back, well, I'm going to go back to browse resources, and then I'm going to select the Krispy Kreme corporate records. Um, let me move that out of the way because I know that this is a multi-level. So here you have an example of uh, a collection uh, that the, the finding aid or the catalog is much more um, hierarchical in nature. So there is that top level resource record here. You see this, the Krispy Kreme corporate records looks very similar to the diary we just looked at. It has all of the notes, um, has all of the subjects and agents, but it also has this hierarchy, which again, as archivists, we're very familiar with this sort of uh, parent-child relationship for records. So within this collection, we have se uh, multiple series, um, and then we're, there are many, many files within each series uh, there, and this series has subseries. So again, very, very familiar to archivists, and the ability to build out this hierarchy is um, 
something that you can do in archive space in a variety of ways. Like I said, you could use rapid data entry, you could load spreadsheet, or you could do it record by record by adding ch children. But this really is where um, you will spend the most of your time as an archivist. I shouldn't say that, but it's, it's where you'll spend a lot of time as an archivist creating finding aids and really building out the, that, that description for your materials and also um, recording relevant information about where that material is stored and where it can be located. Um, so those are resource records. And then finally, I'm very quickly going to talk about digital object records, uh, the third type of record that you can create, um, a material description record you can create in archive space. So at this point, this should look very familiar to you. It is just a blank template for creating a record in archive space. Um, the most important thing to take away from this is that archive space is not a digital asset management system and you cannot ingest or store digital materials into archive space. Archive space supports the management of digital object metadata. So it allows you to manage the description of your archival holdings within a single system. Uh, this way that you can make your digital materials and your physical materials discoverable in one location location um, and you can link out to where the relevant digital material is stored. So the assumption is that files will be stored and managed in a network or web accessible location like a file server at your institution or a digital asset management system that's capable of managing files like that and then you link it back to archive space through um, the file version sub record and here you can see this is just where you would put the link so um if you're you whatever digital asset management system you're using you could link to that there um digital object metadata can be exported as mets mods or dublin core so if you have another system that you want to export the data out of and import it into you can do that um, and then also you can always link relevant uh, digital objects back to your accession and resource records within archive space. So, you know, you may have a letter that you have the physical letter in a file in a box somewhere, but then you also have it digitized and you want to link that physical uh, representation of that item with the digital object. You can do that within archive space. And just like within uh, resource records, um, you can create both simple digital objects within archive space and complex digital objects. I will say this does get even more confusing for a demo. So um, I would recommend if you're interested in learning more about how, how archive space manages digital objects, I would recommend reviewing some of the uh, relevant recordings on our YouTube channel. We have some old trainings for digital object management there. And then there's also presentations from users uh, talking about how they are using um, digital objects at their organization. So um, let's view a created digital object. So um, digital objects can be constructed in archive space as either, either simple or complex. Just like a resource record, you can either have a, a simple digital object. It's one in which the intellectual content of the object is contained in a single file and I'm going to explain that a little bit better in just a second but it looks exactly like a single level resource record in archive space. You would uh, include all of the relevant information for the digital object um, and you can see here that file URI is included so a user can uh, click that and go to the relevant digital asset management system or wherever it's stored. This is simply um, a photograph um, that's at the Smithsonian that uh, it's a single digital file of this single photograph, so it's represented as a simple digital object. Um, alternatively, let's go back to browse. Um, I think this one is complex. Nope. Well, I thought I had a complex digital object. Sorry, I know this is very annoying to watch someone bouncing around. Um, I'm sorry, I thought I had a complex digital object as an example, but I obviously don't. But let me just say complex digital objects are very similar to, to um, hierarchical resource records. It's where you have a parent uh, and then you would have a child here and 
just like with a resource record, you see that once a record is saved, you have the ability to invoke a bunch of different functions, including rapid data entry and um, the ability to add children to create those complex digital objects. The thing uh, that would um, differentiate a simple digital object and a complex digital object is the number of digital files that you have to represent uh, within that context. So for example, um, you might have a, a scrapbook that you have digitized, you could digitize it two different ways. You could digitize this, let's say 150 page scrapbook, and you digitize it and save it as one single file. So you have one PDF, it's a 150 page PDF, um, but it's one single PDF, it's one single file. You would represent that within archive space as a simple digital object. You have one single file that you would save as a simple digital object. Alternatively, you could have decided to digitize that, that scrapbook and every single page is an individual PDF. So you have 150 PDFs. Uh, in that instance, you would probably want to represent that as a complex digital object. So you would have a collection level record that describes the, the scrapbook itself and has that overarching metadata there. And then you would have child records to represent every single individual file. Neither is wrong. Both are perfectly fine. It's just something that you would decide at your organization is how you would want to represent those, those digital objects. And like I said, um, I, I definitely recommend referring to some of our resources on YouTube. And if you are Archive Space members, there's some great stuff um, available um, in the Help Center about digital objects, as well as some additional recordings of trainings and user tutorial videos. All right, and then finally, I'm very quickly going to move over to the public user interface. Um, I'm doing that by just going to the bottom and clicking View Public Interface. So this is the Archive Space public user interface. Um, this is the out of the box, regular, plain Archive Space public user interface. It is very customizable. Obviously, at your organization, you're going to want to uh, make it look more like your own organization, probably not have the Archive Space logo on it, want to make sure that it's themed to your appropriate colors. Um, you might want to add a Q&A section, maybe um, invoke a few plugins. It's very customizable. This is what it looks like out of the box. Um, and I understand you probably don't want to keep it looking like that, but that is customizable. Um, Archive Space includes a public user interface, which publishes the archival description that's entered into the staff interface, but it's only material that you elect to publish. So uh, it does not automatically publish anything, um, and it, it really is dependent on you making the selection of clicking that published box to get those records into Archive Space. And use of the public user interface is entirely optional. Um, instead of using the public user interface, some repositories choose to export metadata outputs into other systems. Um, some use a different front end entirely. Uh, this is completely optional, but it does have, um, out of the box, it does have this public user interface. Uh, like I said, this is really what the default homepage looks like without any customizations. I'm not going to have a lot of time to explore the PUI, but for the purposes of this overview, I'll say um, Archive Space automatically indexes all information into the system. So once you do hit that publish checkbox, the material will publish to Archive Space. You don't have to like do a, a some sort of a push or run a, a something overnight. It will automatically publish to the the public user interface. So just keep that in mind. Um, and it also allows for users to browse by, by a, a variety of parameters. So they could always search, uh, browse across collections. And like I mentioned in um, the staff user side, unlike the staff user side, when you're browsing and searching on the public user interface, you're getting results for every repository in your archive space implementation. So you see here, if you're browsing your collections, which your resource records, uh, you actually can filter it by your different repositories. If you know it has to be in a specific uh, repository, you can limit it to that. Um, and again, you can search by names, subjects, languages. You can, I mean, not search, filter by a variety of formats. Um, you can search by individual repository. If you only want to browse relevant digital material or digital objects, you can. Again, there's a, there's a lot that you can do within the public user interface, including a search. So basic keyword search, just like archive space or the ability, just like archive, just like the staff user interface and the ability to build out um, more um, uh, complex searches. And again, this is going to be searching across 
the entirety of your archive space implementation. So if you have multiple repositories, you would be searching across the, the collections in all of those repositories. Uh, in, the, in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and move back to our slides. Um, all right, so we just did the demo. And uh, talk a little bit about Archive Space membership. So, as I mentioned before, while the Archive Space application is free to download and use, Archive Space has a membership model to support the development of the application and user community. Since Archive Space members directly contribute to the sustainability of the application, they're entitled to certain benefits in addition to the ability to serve on governance councils and provide input on the application or the development of the application. A little background about membership. Currently, we have 477 Archive Space member organizations. Membership is at the organizational level, and all employees within an organization are entitled to benefits. So if your organization is a member of Archive Space, you are entitled to all benefits. Membership is distributed across five levels with corresponding fees, and uh, membership levels range from very small to very large, and the corresponding fee, very small, is $300 a year, very large is $7,500 a year. Uh, and over half of our members are either very small or small organizations. Um, and those membership levels are intended to reflect organizational size and capacity, all members are entitled to the same benefits regardless of your membership size. And I am gonna be providing a series of links at the end of this presentation with this information and more. And then I'll make sure that a link to these slides is included with the recording. So what are benefits? I keep talking about these benefits. So uh, Archive Space member benefits include access to the Help Center, which includes our user manual, our user tutorial videos, and recordings of uh, past trainings that are not available on YouTube. Um, and I've mentioned the Help Center several times because you can get to it so easily through the application, uh, but it is a, a very tangible benefit of membership to Archive Space. Uh, you also get access to member-only events and programs like our Archive Space member forums. We hold a virtual forum, member forum every spring, and we have an in-person forum every fall. Uh, and then you also can participate in member-only programs like our member match program, which is a peer-to-peer -peer support program that you, is optional to participate in, but you can participate in. You also get access to member-only listservs where users communicate with one another and share advice. Uh, you get discounts on training. You get technical support for the application. So if you have an issue, you can email us and we can get a tech support ticket going for you if you're a member. Uh, and then you also just get the ability to collaborate with archivists around the world and guide the development of the application and member community. So you, uh, you get to be part of this really great program and community. All right, and finally, uh, this slide, again, which will be included with the recording, contains a lot of helpful links to reference as you explore Archive Space. Um, you can also find all of these on our website, of course. The first link is to our Getting Started page. It is a great place to get started. It has um, a lot of information. Um, it has an Archive Space sandbox that you can play around in so you don't have to download anything to decide if Archive Space is the right tool for your needs. It has um, demos like this one, as well as some other recordings, um, and just other helpful resources. You also can learn more about benefits at the link below that, and those corresponding fees and levels at the link below that. And if you're interested in Archive Space membership and are not sure how to approach that with your maybe your uh, director or the person that would be making that decision, we have a link here that provides you with some talking points uh, to help make your case for Archive Space membership. And then the final link at the bottom is to our Who's Using Archive Space page. And that's just a list of all Archive Space members, or almost all Archive Space members. So if you want to see if uh, there's any organizations that you know that are already using Archive Space, uh, that's a great resource. And finally, our uh, email address is at the bottom. So with that, I'm going to open up the Q&A and see um, what we have for questions. All right, good. Um, all right, so would you like me oh. to read off the questions to you? It's quite a bit, quite a few. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, let me, that would let be me good. go ahead and do that. Um, okay. okay, the first question is, is it possible to change the field labels? 
So, and Christine's here, uh, our space program manager, that's Christine, uh, you can correct me if I say anything wrong. The actual labels themselves, um, I think that you would need to, I, you would need to do that as a plugin, right? Yeah, you can do some customizations. One would be to do a plugin, one would be uh, to do it directly through some text files that come in your release, uh, and but live on your server. So you need someone who has access to the server to help you with that. And the next question is, how do you deal with imprecise date, e.g. early 20th century? So uh, first I'll say that this is this is a great question for the listserv, and it's the type of question that comes up often in the user community, just advice on how to deal with those sorts of little weird things that happen in archives. Um, but uh, probably you would want to use um, the date expression field. I'm not going to have time to get into talk of, talking about dates a lot and how you can express dates in archive space, but there's two different ways you can express dates in archive space. One is um, by using machine readable begin and end dates, and another is to use a, a date expression field that is a more like a human readable field, um, and that would probably would be where you'd would want to record that information. Um, again, not gonna have time to get into using dates. There's reasons to use a human readable date expression and a machine readable begin and end date. Um, and people have opinions about both, but um, I would say that would be a great question, a listserv question, but yes, you can record that as a date expression field. Then we have a few questions related to integrations and I'll field these. Uh, okay. So we have a question related to Preservica integration. Uh, and then another question about Primo and Rosetta integration. So as Jessica mentioned, we do have a pretty powerful API in ArchivesSpace, and that can help lots of different institutions talk to ArchivesSpace. Uh, and uh, sorry, lots of different applications talk to ArchivesSpace too. Uh, so uh, we do have a number of, of organizations and in some cases, proprietary vendor communities uh, that have built integrations with archive space. Preservica is one of them. You would want to con contact Preservica about the specifics related to it, including what version of Preservica and what version of archive space is going to work best for that integration, as well as the specifics of what can be done with that. Uh, but Preservica is definitely one where an integration has already been, been, been built and a number of community members use it. Um, in terms of Primo and Rosetta, there are also institutions I know for sure that use Primo um, in conjunction with ArchivesSpace. I would also encourage you to contact the vendor um, about that, about the specifics. So as Jessica said, uh, this would be uh, the kind of thing that on our, our user listservs, the kind of thing that you could ask people, uh, see what they're doing, how they're using it, especially knowing that people are using Primo in conjunction with archive space. Rosetta, I'm, I'm really not sure if there are specific users using that or if an integration has been built. Uh, so I'd encourage you to contact the vendor on that uh, and you know see. Anything is really possible, uh, and it's really a matter of whether people have already thought to do it uh, and how they've thought to do it and whether that would meet the needs that you have. Uh, the next question is about incorporating the records and context, context standard into archive space. So um, I think Jessica probably mentioned that our underlying content standard in archive space is DAX, uh, and that will remain true. Uh, but we do have a metadata standard sub team that's one of our community groups and they look at different existing and emerging standards to consider the extent to which archive space should support provide support for them, uh, as well as, um, you know, with surveying the community to find out how much interest there is in supporting specific standards. At this point, um, I think they've, their decision has been kind of to take a wait and see attitude on records and context. So there is not currently support, specific support for records and context in archive space. Um, I don't know actually in the whole larger worldwide community to what extent um, people have actually implemented that yet um, versus taking a, you know, a wait and see attitude too. But I would say that that would be a watch this space 
Uh, and certainly as our community develops and if it develops in directions where records and context is a really important standard to support, uh, archive space tries to be uh, reflective and responsive to that. So I would encourage you to get a, get a discussion going around that if that's something that's really important to you. The next question, I think, Jessica, this can probably go back to you. Yeah. Um, in the case of the diary that you created a collection record for, can that be translated into a Mark bibliographic record if you wanted to catalog it as a book, for example? Yeah, so if you have um, created a resource record, you can export that out as Mark XML. So it is possible to export EAD, Mark records, and PDFs for uh, those collection level records. Next question uh, is, is it possible to create new digital objects and link them to existing resource records as a child or a sibling? Okay, so uh, this is, it gets a little in the weeds, but yes, it is possible to create digital objects and link them to existing uh, resource records or child records for resource records. Um, the way you would do that is through the instances um, sub, sub, uh, record within a resource record. So you would go in and you would say, yes, I have this letter. It is here in my resource record. And here is the instance where it is a digital object instance. And here's the link. So yes, it is possible to link the two. Um, I would definitely recommend reviewing some trainings on how to do that. Next question is, can you import existing catalog data in Excel into archive space? Yes. So uh, the way that you would do that is through those uh, import templates that I mentioned. So um, if you want to go to our sandbox, if you don't have access to an archive space implementation, you can go to our sandbox and look at those bulk import templates. And it, it gives you a variety of different record types that you would be looking to import into archive space. And you can download either, um, either as Excel or CSV those spreadsheets so that you can get the data into archive space that way. Next question, if the publish function is instant, does that mean removing it as instant too? Uh, I mean, instant in the sense that like how long it takes your system to index, I would recommend being very, very sure you want to publish material before you hit publish because even, even if you hit unpublish and there, for resource records, there's an unpublish all button. If you were like, oh, we got to get this collection down, you can hit unpublish all, but um, as we all know, once something is on the internet, it's on the internet forever. So if you had someone that was um, maybe uh, trawling your website, then that information could still live elsewhere. So just be very mindful about what you're publishing. Uh, the next question is about hosted and other versions. And I'm just gonna, I'm, I'll answer that okay. just really briefly. So archive, the archive space itself, as Jessica said, it's free to download and use. It's also free for people to provide services for. Uh, so the version of archive space that is out there, anybody can use to do anything they like with it. The archive space program builds the application uh, and supports the community through all the different kinds of membership benefits and membership services that Jessica has described. There are a, host, a lot of hosting providers out there that can, uh, can help you do the deployment of the application in addition to you being able to host it yourself. Uh, so if you are interested in hosting, you would want to contact individual providers about what they do with the application, what services they provide, but Archive Space itself provides the same version of, of the application to anybody, whether they want to host it themselves or have a hosting provider do it. Uh, the next question is, does the PUI have the ability for archive users to order items from the vaults for consultation in the reading room? So archive space is does isn't like a circulation management tool, um, so it can't do those like necessarily all the circulation management functions you may want. Uh, it does integrate with those sorts of systems, um, and I know that there are users who have integrated those systems. But archive space does have a request functionality uh, that allows a user. Uh, to request material from the page that they're on. All it does is it pulls up a form that allows them to send an email to whoever you deem appropriate that says, hey, I'm interested in this specific material. And then it would be up to you to reach out to them um, to arrange that reading room visit. The next question is about whether there's a module for, oh, you you clicked it away. So. I got, went, got ahead of myself, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> 
a module for managing current and semi-current records, i.e. records management, as opposed to archival collections management. Um, I'll, Christine, would you like to answer that one? Uh, I can. So yeah. records management is not built into archives phase as a module. Uh, there are some fields in archives phase that would clearly be relevant for records management functions you might be doing, uh, including uh, it, within the accession record, there's a place to indicate like a record schedule, things like that. But Again, archive space is free to download and use. People can do build all kinds of things they like with it, um, including through plugins. There are some institutions that have built plugins uh, and sort of standalone modules uh, for records management. Uh, so it's the kind of question that you can put out to uh, the community to see what's out there uh, in terms of that kinds of functionality. But I do know that some institutions are doing that. Um, there's a question here about what's new in uh, version 3.4, which is the one that, that uh, Jessica is using compared to previous versions. Uh, in general, uh, each time we put out a release, there are release notes with the release uh, that describe what are the new and exciting features in that release, as well as for those who are super technically minded, listing all the pull requests that went in and all the code that went into that release. Uh, the biggest um, focus of new functionality in the version 3.4 release uh, was uh, related to being able to designate and view digital objects in the public user interface. The release notes will have more though. Um, there's a question about what's the largest migration of data into archive space for a previous system. So our program, we don't manage deployments of archive space for people. Uh, we don't manage migrations uh, for people, uh, but many of our hosting providers do that as well as institutions have done that individually. So this is a great method, great question for the community. Uh, it's a great question for individual hosting providers you might be considering, but we do have very large institutions that have moved into archive space from previous systems, uh, including in some cases like large national libraries, some of the biggest research universities in the world. Uh, so there's nothing within archive space itself that limits the amount of data that can come in there. Um, we do have specific migration pathways uh, and import uh, pathways, uh, but the, you know, I wouldn't say the sky's the limit, but there, there is precedent for quite large migrations going into archive space. Uh, the next question is about, do you provide any contracted pay extra services of doing some of the original setup for new members? Or do we have lists of freelancers that are open to being contracted? We do maintain a list of independent consultants who provide all sorts of different services for archive space. Many of the hosting providers for archive space do that as well. Uh, on the program side, we don't do deployments or migrations for institutions, but many of our member services do help people uh, in terms of getting used to their new archive space, setting it up different ways they want. So depending on what specific things you're looking at, uh, you may find that membership is enough for you, or you may find that an independent consultant or a service provider would be good for you. Uh, next question, can archive space be used to catalog mixed collections, including artwork, badges, silverware? I'll put that over to you, Jessica. Sure, yeah, yeah, you definitely can. Um describe mixed material collections within archive space. And you can, um, through a controlled value list, uh, designate what the material type is. And that is a customizable list within archive space. So um, depending on your collections, you could could uh, differentiate that. Um, there are, if you're a museum and your archive space may not be the right tool, you're talking about silverware and things like that. So obviously archives are a bit of a catch-all and can have all kinds of things. So yes, you definitely can describe mixed material collections, but if you're looking specifically for like a, a museum tool, archive space may not be the, the right tool for your needs. Okay, the last question that I'll take myself uh, is related to cert security certification. Do we have one like SOC2 or ISO 27001? Uh, so archive space, a lot of, we don't do deployments 
for people that usually that's going to be a hosting provider or your self-hosted um, deployment that you might do. A lot of questions related to security are probably more appropriately directed to who's actually doing your deployment. Um, but depending on what you're looking for, um, contact us on the program side and uh, we can point you to what kinds of information we do have about our security processes and procedures. And then Jessica, last one for you, how can top containers deal with volumes? Um, so I would say that's a great question uh, for the community. Um, and, and I would recommend uh, reviewing some of the trainings that we have on our YouTube channel um, and playing around in the sandbox and looking at how top containers deals with volumes that way. Um, there, there are a lot of different things that you can do with top containers. Top containers does not necessarily have to mean a box. Um, it can mean many different things. Um, so I would say that's definitely one where I would, uh, you can always reach out to us directly for more information, but looking at our getting started page would be a, a great way to begin there. Okay, we got one more question yep. snuck in here and I'll, I'll take this one too. Okay. Is there any audit trail for amendments made to a record or if a record is completely deleted from the system. Um, there isn't a complete audit trail in archive space for changes to the record. Uh, there is information about who, who and when it was created and, and who and when it was last touched. Um, so there's not that, but not anything in the in-between. I do know that there has been a plugin developed out in the community that does provide a like a larger, more detailed auto audit trail. Uh, so that would be one possibility to look into. And then also um, development in archive space is determined by community interests and community priorities. Uh, so we do have a public development catalog. Uh, I do, do believe that this is a, a kind of thing where people have requested this and there's been some discussion around it. Um, so if you're interested in that and you're interested in really getting involved in the community, you might want to check out our public development catalog uh, and consider either submitting this or um, participating in the discussion around that. All right, thank you, Christine. We did it. We answered all of the questions. Uh, all right, uh, we are um, four minutes past the top of the hour, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up here. Uh, but thank you to everyone for sticking with us to the end. And if you have any additional questions uh, or would like clarification on some of the questions, please feel free to email us at archivespacehome at lyricist.org uh, or check out some of the, the links that are included in this. And this recording will be up on our YouTube very soon. Thank you, everyone.